you know, we're not government advisors, we're not here to build industry or commerce. We're here to put the Taliban to the ground and make them negotiate. This is where bin Laden launched the attacks in 9-11. So this is where it all started. And I know we're divided politically on the home front, but uh, this, this, we can't be divided on this. In April 2017, when the Marines first returned to Helmand, long considered to be Afghanistan's most violent and dangerous province, they faced a Taliban insurgency that had overwhelmed the Afghan forces we left behind following the 2014 drawdown. This drawdown will continue, and by the end of next year, our war in Afghanistan will be over. We knew that the security situation had deteriorated significantly since, since our departure in, in 14. So when we were coming back, you know, we, we knew this was a daunting task, and we knew there was a lot to be done. To get a better understanding of what the Marines were up against when they returned to Helmand, and how the situation has evolved in the months since President Trump announced a troop surge as part of his new South Asia strategy. A lasting defeat. I embedded with the 6th Marine Regiment at Camp Shorab, a modest outpost next door to the Afghan National Army's 215th Corps base. We came into a situation in Helmand Province, in particular around Lashkar Gah, where you know, I guess the verbiage we used was crisis advising. And we had an essential task of not allowing the provincial capital to fall to the Taliban. So it was, it was game on from the moment we got here. As part of the military's broader train, advise, and assist mission, the 300 Marines based at Camp Shorab are tasked with supporting the ANA's 215th Corps and the 505th Zone National Police, who, up until spring 2017, were suffering heavy losses as Taliban militants overran their checkpoints and came dangerously close to taking control of Lashkar Gah. Historically, here in Helmand, they've taken more casualties while they've been in checkpoints than when they've been on the offensive. And we've proven over the last eight months that uh, with our support and their offensive nature, it's put the, the Taliban and, and any of the other nefarious actors kind of on their back heels, and it's, it's allowed them to continue to gain, gain ground. But rather than have the Marines on the ground shoulder to shoulder with Afghan forces, like they were in 2010 during the bloody Battle of Sangin, their support now comes in the form of precision airstrikes that originate here in the Joint Operations Center, a war room equipped with a dozen screens broadcasting various parts of the Helmand battlefield. This is mostly the nucleus of the task force, if you will. It's really where the war is happening uh, through these screens. While embedded with the six Marines, I was given rare access to film inside the Joint Operations Center and watched as alleged members of the Taliban were targeted and killed in real time. Uh, we look to identify individuals with either uh, ICOM, like uh, intercom systems, uh, communication devices, or uh, weapons. And uh, the cameras are, are close enough that they can identify weapons on individuals as they're um, you know, moving in and out tree lines and along the roads. Instead of us being right next to them, calling in the airstrike, there's, uh, there's guys in here that are calling in those airstrikes from this room. We're giving them that, that extra boost, that, that morale boost and that confidence because I'm a ground guy and uh, love to have the overhead cover of aircraft. If you have it, you feel invincible. Access to this kind of air power has given the Afghan security forces a distinct advantage over the Taliban. It's not just coalition aircraft carrying out the strikes. The Afghan Air Force ATACs, or tactical air controllers, are already calling in targets to their own aircraft, like the MD-530 attack helicopter. Starting back with Operation Maiwan 8 and 9, which were the two most recent operations, we uh, confirmed uh, that successful MD-530 strikes were, were coordinated by the ATACs that went out to the field to support those, those forces. And we were able to, to verify that it actually made a significant difference and allowed friendly forces to gain more ground than they maybe have uh, previously without that air support. A week after ABC-10 left Hellman, the ATACs we spent time with took part in an offensive in Marja, a town amidst Hellman's vast poppy range, about 30 miles south of Camp Shorab. According to U.S. officials, the ATACs used their training to help conduct the first dynamic strike with the Afghan Air Force's A-29 bombers, allowing Afghan security forces to gain more ground and clear over 100 IEDs from the area. How big of a threat are IEDs still uh, in Afghanistan? <laughs> massive. Massive. Th massive threat. That's uh, the enemy's go-to. And how often are these guys running up against them? Uh, daily. 
that every mission they go out on, um, route clearance is definitely uh, one of the most important capabilities that the uh, soldiers have out here. During a three-month span in 2017, more than 3,000 people were killed or injured by IEDs in Afghanistan, making it the only country in U.S. Central Command to see an increase in both incidents and casualties from the devices, according to Department of Defense statistics obtained by foreign policy. The training aids that we use, we, we try and make sure that it's as realistic as possible to uh, make sure that these guys, when they see it in the battlefield, they know what they're looking at. Despite the rise in IED casualties, the Afghan National Army Army's 215th Corps Hospital has seen a reduction in patients since the Marines arrived. Brigadier General Hussein Golpaknad, Helmand's regional medical commander, told me that due to the training his physicians have received from the Marines, coupled with good planning and organization, the hospital is now one of the top facilities in the nation. Our enemy is defeated around Helmand, and the only two ways that are left for them to assault us are suicide attacks or by hiring women and children to plant IEDs and detonate them along the roadside. The fighting is far from over. According to the U.S. officials I spoke with on the ground, it's no less intense than when the Marines returned in spring 2017. In fact, just hours before we arrived at the hospital, a 25-year-old soldier had been brought in with a gunshot wound. He said he'd been shot by Taliban militants during an operation in Goresh. The operation is going excellent, with a high level of cooperation and coordination between different Afghan security forces and coalition forces against the Taliban. As long as the Marines provide us the air support, we can go anywhere we want and we can attack the Taliban. We are in an offensive position right now. It's too early to tell whether the Marines' successes in Helmand will prove to be a watershed in the 16-year-long war. But it's clear that even amid the poppy fields that supply the majority of the global heroin trade and fuel the financial engine of the Taliban, Afghan security forces are winning the fight. You're seeing local Pashtun Afghan security forces rise up against the Taliban. You're seeing them fight side by side with their Afghan army brothers to defeat the Taliban. Um, that's not happening in other provinces, but it's happening in Helmand. And it's huge. Some of the old Marines I spent time with, who were on their second and third tours in Afghanistan, were quick to tell me that the war they're fighting today hardly feels like a war at all. They no longer patrol outside the wire, and the only face time they get with the locals in Helmand happens on opposite sides of barbed wire fences. When you've seen young Marines die and get uh, maimed or lose limbs, if the Afghans are able and willing to go out and take the fight to the Taliban, then we should let them. I think ANDSF is winning the fight here. They're on the offense, they're moving around the battlefield, they go where they want, they do what they want, they support themselves, and that's forced the Taliban to react to them. The level of commitment that we're showing to the Afghan population, that, hey, we're gonna stay until the job's done. We're not putting an artificial timeline. We're not gonna communicate to the enemy that we're gonna leave on this day no matter what. We're, no, we're not gonna leave till the job's done. I don't know how long it's gonna take, and I can't tell you exactly what victory is gonna look like, but I know what defeat looks like, and that is absolutely not something we should allow to happen.